Hi, welcome to episode one of the Gens Aurelia podcast. This is sort of a production blog of all of the projects that I will make throughout the course of the Adobe Creative Residency. And this episode is a sort of demonstration of what a typical podcast might be like um, if I were to get a place on the residency and just go into detail on all the things that I did to produce the spec piece that I put together for uh, my application. So my project for the residency is based around how can I prove to people that learning is more doable than they believe. And this comes from a project that I did uh, about six months ago called Fruits of Labour, where I realised I had never shot on film before in terms of photography, and I wanted to see if just leaning into the physical requirements of that practice meant that I could learn how to become a competent film photographer. And what I found was you can do that. You absolutely can. And I actually became very empowered because I was now confident in film photography where I initially thought it was going to be quite a difficult thing to, to learn how to do. And then I realised that that could apply to anything. There's, you know, It's really no groundbreaking discovery because it proves that practice makes perfect. Um, and if you want to get better at something, you practice it. And that's that's no new discovery but I don't think it's easy to really understand that without demonstration um, or you know experiencing that first hand or setting out to test whether that's the case so having done that project and found that I actually could look to I could teach myself um, a new skill I wanted to apply this to something larger scale so my background has always been in video production um, the first skill that I picked up about 10 years ago was editing and then all of the skills came naturally through my developing of the edit. So I learned camera work to improve the footage that I could edit, I learned photography to improve my camera work, I learned motion graphics to have more flexibility and creativity in the edit. Everything sort of comes down to that sort of post-production element. However, that doesn't mean to say that I have got a you know, I've even scratched the surface on what's possible there because especially now with the software that's available and the creative potential of all of the, you know, different softwares and techniques and practices um, that exist within the VFX industry, I have a lot more to learn. So the project that I wanted to propose to Adobe was I'll spend one year creating and then executing focused briefs that tackle skill areas that a VFX artist needs to be competent in, regardless of whether I'm good at them. Um, and then those briefs, I will document the entire process from research to um, actually applying any knowledge that I find, who I get that knowledge from, the experience of putting it together, things that I discovered as I was doing it, things that I maybe um, had the wrong idea about and then I discovered that I was wrong and there was a better way of thinking about a certain thing or a better way of executing or you know, a better workflow for a certain thing. And then with each of these briefs, after doing the research, after applying the knowledge, I then share that entire process with other people. And this is something that's based from the um, philosophy of Stoicism, which is something that I've been reading a lot recently, uh, which is all to do with using logic and rationality to empower oneself. Basically saying things like, if someone else can do a thing, there is no reason why you, another human being with the same faculties and the same ability in terms of you know, you've got a functioning body, you've got a mind that you can apply to, to problem solving, there's no reason why you can't achieve the same thing. So what I want people to get out of this project, which is sort of metaphysical in that it's a, a project based around projects, like the, 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 the write-up of the project is usually something that just accompanies a project, but for this project, 
the project is the write up and then the the you know the the actual deliverable whatever that may be title sequence animation whatever that's that's almost just like um related material that's just sort of supporting um content to 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 reference to uh to give reference to so going back the point of this is i want people to realize that there is a 22 year old professionally inexperienced vfx enthusiast who is putting out work that other 22 23 21 young people creatives people not employed in the professional um you know vfx industry do not realize that they're capable of themselves doing so i want people to see someone who has no qualification who's you know not top tier doesn't have this amazing portfolio doesn't have um the inside track or all these connections that uh, uh, give me some sort of advantage or boost someone just leaning into the practice and putting out work that is good enough to be deemed as you know something to apply to a professional job with or something to make a you know a a real strong artistic portfolio with and if people can be there for that journey and be there for each of these design briefs which I've planned to sort of last two weeks then they can be present for the entire decision making process one of the things that i found quite hard about being artistic and being creative is making those decisions is hard because you feel like things need to have a reason and need to be justified so when you see other people create things that you really like in terms of you know work you know if you really think of it if you really like a title sequence or you really like um some some other you know vfx piece you can watch it and appreciate it for, for what it is but you can be puzzled over why have they done it in that way what does this mean what's the the symbolism there what's the message behind that what was the creative reason and what was the um why did they choose this and not something else and that's very rarely shared um you know unless you go and look for some niche interview or quite hard to find behind the scenes type thing but generally what tends to happen is you just get a lot of speculators so people will analyse it who weren't involved in the production and I think it would be really valuable if th that that did exist for VFX projects so that's what I want to do I, I want to create a comprehensive behind the scenes that tells people here's what I made and here's how I made every single bit of it so that they can then absorb my practice and apply it to their own things because and this is the mantra of the fruits of labor genzarelia project i want people to realize you can and here's how so without further ado let's talk about the design brief that i put together for my application so the brief that i put together the top line was create a 60 second tv style title sequence for the Fruits of Labour Genzarelia project. So this 12 month um, massive project based on two week smaller projects, create a TV title sequence for that, that whole operation. And it was, it was ambitious. It was, it was uh, quite a heavy, in terms of time, um vfx project and one that challenged me to use a lot of skills that i haven't particularly used before so i'm just going through the the behance here um which is available if 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 people want to just go to owen seabrook on behance or just type fruits of labor into behance they'll find it but the areas that i had to use a lot which i don't tend to um need to use or haven't needed to use so far 
really in any depth um, in After Effects is things like 3D camera movement and then the the depth of field that's related to that frame by frame animation um, that's not something I've had to do an awful lot of uh, motion graphics that have a certain visual style so I had to really dig into how to replicate the idea of pixels um, on a screen and something that I was talking to with uh, talking to my um, photography lecturer um, about recently was the idea of you know for, for anything that is you know a, a certain process is really useful for VFX to be able to know the form of a thing and this this is super vague but being able to know the form of something helps you to characterize it in a VFX project so if you want to show that something is quite digital you can create like a pixel texture and and use that or if you want to give the idea and both of these are, are visible in this project the idea that something is on paper you use the, the, the sensibilities of paper, the aesthetic of paper to give it that character. So those sort of things, um, this asked me, this, this uh, project demanded of me to sort of dig into. The other thing is I tend not, or I've, I have tended not in recent years to need to do much in the way of defining a real strong concept. And what I mean by that is a lot of the work I've had to do over the last few years, and to give some context, I run a small production agency um, in Leeds in the UK where I work for clients in generally the digital sector, but in, in sort of quite, there's, there's, it's been quite an eclectic range, but my projects tend to be quite surface level, it tends to be quite um all substance and no style which i think is a a shame and a, yeah i i'm usually in these conversations with clients i'm trying to push for more creativity and ambition in art and i just get asked you know but can we just put more usps on screen and that sort of thing so i never really get to do anything that's really conceptual and i think conceptual things can sell something better than just surface level literal um demonstration on screen so I didn't want to go into this project without having a really clear idea um, of the message that I wanted to put across in this title sequence title sequences as you know this is they're quite a popular um, thing of focus uh, if you look at you know there's there's a there's a lot of media analyzing title sequences and, and there's people like Saul Bass who were the um you know the 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 OG title sequence designers going into the 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 current day where we've got people like Ash Thorpe but they all tend to have some sort of story or reference and I'll just get a couple of um examples up one of the uh the big ones um recently and by recently I mean you know last sort of 30 years was the seven title sequence were the sort of the misprint aesthetic the printed um, text that's all sort of uh, offset and all off kilter and then the scratched credits of, of the actors names um, you know in the, the production team and things that all goes to create this idea of you know discomfort inhumanity you know that that sort of inner horror of the you know the the, the, the warped mind of this serial killer um other examples would include just quickly <laughs> just uh, scrolling down um uh, Google Images for some more examples. Um, off off the top of my head, one of the X Men, um, the new X Men films that have been created, 
the design style there is all to do with um, genetics and it's um, it's uh, is chromosomes the right word it's chromosomes like joining together and there's the X being formed and then separating and that all of these sort of microscopic style de like geometric representations of genes and genetic code um, another example American Gods that title sequence is awesome it's a very very heavily stylized as is the show itself um, series of close-ups of a single item which is then shown in full on the final shot and the item is a totem pole constructed of popular culture icons contextualized in a religious light so you've got a there's a shot at one point of a menorah but instead of candle holders the actual holder are uh, they are um plug sockets and jacks of, of different types like you've got like a um like an xlr cable jack where the candle should sit um there's a, a spaceman on a cross um so it's this idea of like the 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 icons the gods of the modern world and that's what the whole theme of the show is the 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 old gods the religious gods um are being pushed out by new gods like media and um I think technology as well um so yeah there's i think the key thing that i found in my research was title sequences are a very economical project you can't bombard too much information in there you have to have a really almost just a, like a, a, a skeleton like everything needs to be cut away except the bare essentials and then they can be explored and developed and stylized so I looked to the um, strategy that I was going to use for this this project, and I thought the the best thing to demonstrate the fruits of labor Genzarelia project would be the actual strategy that underpins all of the design briefs that I'm going to do. So, the strategy is threefold: it is source, apply, and share. Uh, as I as I mentioned before, sourcing information, applying it, and sharing it. So, in the vein of creating a sort of narrative um, journey with a, a setup and a and an ending, I broke the title sequence down into three acts, and those acts were um, each designed around. A specific design style and concepts for source, apply, and share. So, first act is source, second act is apply, third act is share. Uh, just quickly mention at this point, the audio was just a dramatic um, Philip Glass soundtrack, I think it was. Um, I need to double check that. I just sort of, I did a bit of searching in Spotify um, and just found it. But I will... Uh, I will I will I will verify that before the podcast is through. Um but yeah, so it's it, it was source apply and share. So the key things in source were I needed to represent the not only the sourcing of industry specific information, but also make reference to the philosophy behind why this sort of pursuit of knowledge is important because the whole thing is to do with education really it's to do with teaching people not only physical tangible things about you know here's how you make pixels on a after effects comp it's about teaching people a level of self esteem that will empower them to go and work on these projects 
So it was important for me to in the source section to use the um, the philosophy as well as ideas of research. Apply. I try to think what good visual language talks about application, or, or you know brings reference to application. And I thought the best way to demonstrate application would be to embody it through plans because plans are things that are created that show intent to do something people design plans because they need the plan to be able to go ahead with something else so i adopted um aesthetics of grids and blueprints and sketches and scribbles um what else? Even going into things like shop breakdowns and layouts and, and editorial things. But it's all to do with, you know, basically showing anatomy and um, the ins and outs of a shop, the inner workings, the sort of behind the veil of the both the the techniques used to create the shot but also the thinking used to come to that final idea and the final shot uh, so the final act is sure and with sure I thought the easiest thing to do would be to give reference to media so the design style was digital because the entire project would be shared digitally in the form of video um, website or web pages i.e. the Behance projects um, and audio and the um, the yeah so it's, it's all it's all pixelated and it's all sort of gives reference to web based uh, media and content so jumping back to act one there was a number of different techniques here. The biggest challenge for me was shot uh, four. If you count, and shot four is the rotating column of uh, book titles in 3D space with loads of little illegible excerpts of text coming off them in one giant mind map that's meant to be overwhelming. I was actually limited by the hardware, uh, I feel because um, it's uh, it, it, there were so many 3D layers in there that the the actual to render the shot just took forever um, and I'm you know I'm working off of my laptop which is for all intents purposes a decent laptop but <laughs> I had to get you know the the rest of the, the piece done as well so I had to sort of skip through it as fast as I could um, but I was really pleased with being able to find how to solve it so the difficulty there and this is where this is going to start to get quite technical and, and anyone who wants to know the ins and outs of the vfx and to hear me speak about the ins and outs of, of the actual production is this this is where that sort of begins so 3d layers will conform to the depth of field of a 3d camera and the view of a 3d camera whereas 2d layers maintain their position regardless of where you move the 3d camera Initially, I tried to use 3D shape layers, but because shape layers only have the one anchor point, positioning them to join between the column and the excerpt was going to be really tricky because I'd have to rotate it in three axes and then get it to line up, and then I might realize I rotated it too much. Um, it was a sort of back and forth thing. So I did some tests with beams. Uh, beam is an effect on After Effects that you can drop onto a solid and it replaces the solid in the same way that fractal noise or particles or whatever else. It replaces the solid with a beam. The beam has visual parameters, so the thickness of each end, the colour, if it has like an outer glow to it, and the length of it between two defined start and end points and it's a start and end point so are really important here 
and I was struggling because again this is where 2D layers sh struggle with 3D because they will retain their position so you know maybe one option would be to keyframe the ends of the point um the the sorry the points of the ends of the line to match the camera rotation um or um you know try and like sort of 2D represent the the rotation by like moving the the points in a way that looks like it could be 3D but I wanted that depth of field as well as the thing so what I realized when I set a, a, a the 2D solid layer to a 3D layer is that yes it would rotate but it would actually move out of the boundary of the solid and disappear which also didn't work for me um that's where the two comp expression came in and this is awesome so a video that i watched a while ago was a behind the scenes by um red or oh, red uh, giant it is yeah, Red Giant, so the, the company that make um, a lot of different sort of, uh, I think they make plugins, do they? But basically, the a guy who works at Red Giant created this short film um, that's all to do with, yo, oh, sorry, yeah, of course, uh, Red make trap code, so Particular and Form and Mer and all of those cool plugins for After Effects. A guy designed a short film in the style of like old like Atari games and old video games from back in the day and he found beams to be the best to construct his uh, his models it's all done in After Effects and it's it's a really interesting watch to just see how we did it and I've linked it in my Behance profile in my Behance uh, project but he found there is an expression that you can apply to um, the nulls of... If you parent the end and start points of the beam to 3D nulls, you can put this expression on the nulls that is 2 comp, open bracket, open square bracket, 0, comma, 0, comma, 0, close square bracket, close bracket, and you can then re rotate a 3D camera and you will see that rotation happen properly. So what ended up happening was for every single one of these beams, one of these connecting lines in this giant, you know, mind map diagram-esque thing, I had to have two nulls. So if you count all the lines in that shot, and then times that by three, that's how many layers I needed to actually achieve this shot. And that became a lot easier to position on the layers as well because I just had to move the nulls to where I needed them to be especially the ones that the ends that would connect with the central column because I could just copy and paste those positions and then sort of just slide them to give them just some variation you know a bit from you know some would be further up some would be lower down some would be to one side some would be to one side but that was it and the, the, you know the shot worked really well the story of that shot because it's preceded by a reveal of book titles and the books that you can see are books that I've read that have been of some use to me and have influenced how I've gone forward. Um, so it's that idea of reference. Uh, research is important again. But the um, the excerpts that you then see in the wider shot with all of the beams, they're intelligible. Some of them are literally just me just typing gibberish on, onto the keyboard to just fill the place. Some of them are the stoic um, excerpts from Meditations, which you can see in shot two, where it says a project by Owen Seabrook, and then you can see little um, excerpts from the book Meditations by Marcus Aurelius, which is one of the main stoicism books. Uh, where he sort of just basically it's his, it's his personal writings and he writes a lot of stuff and one of the really good phrases in there is and this is sort of relates to the whole idea of the project is not to assume it's impossible because you find it difficult 
but to recognize that if it's humanly possible, you can do it too. So some of these text boxes that are holding text, the, the story of it is that they are, you know, maybe like findings or discoveries or bits of learning that are useful that these books in the central column have exp in inspired. Also, that column leaves the bottom of the frame. That's just a list of books copy and pasted. I haven't actually read <laughs> that many books to be able to fill that column. Um, it is like, it's maybe like 25 books that's just copy and paste and copy and paste until it like leaves the frame. Um, but yeah, the, the, the story of the shot is those books inspired learnings or new knowledge, which is why the, there are text boxes floating around the columns because they've come from that learning. Um, in the apply section, there are a few shots that I was really pleased with. Um, one was another use of expression, actually, uh, and context. So I have, I've tried to learn coding, but I've just never really put the time in, and I've been trying to learn for a few years now, and I always sort of download some sort of app or something to, you know, test my uh you know my html and things like that it's never really clicked for me um just because i haven't really had time to properly practice it but with doing after effects i know a little bit of javascript or at least i know that certain things are possible with javascript and that makes it really rewarding when i actually come up with a, a, a way to sort of create my own expression without having to look anything up um and it works and the shot six which is the anatomy of shot five being broken down and spread out in this sort of blueprint-esque thing uh view was one of those instances of a um expression being used and actually worked and i was really pleased with it so basically if you look at that shot you can see every layer is broken down onto its own plane. So the background is one plane, the picture of Seneca is one plane, who is another Stoic. And then you've got planes for each of the lines and the boxes that are being drawn around the elements um, from shot five. Because basically the, the what you're seeing is a like a wireframe view of shot five and all the things that are there. Um, being replaced with sort of bounding boxes and placed onto a grid. So the the grid that you can see is on its own plane, the lines and bounding boxes are on their own plane, the pictures on the plane, the background's on the plane. And I wanted this these planes, of which there are 11, to expand, which you can see them do on the shot. They start quite tight together and they, they expand out. So after a bit of thinking, I realised what I can do is treat the final position as a hundred percent and then a start position as zero percent by which i mean because there's 11 frames i went to the middle sorry there's 11 planes i went to the middle plane which is the sixth plane set that z position to zero pixels. Then I went to the ones either side of that, so planes five and seven. Set those to 50 pixels and minus 50 pixels. I went to the planes either side of that, so planes four and eight, minus 100 pixels, 100 pixels, and carried on. So what I got was the 11 planes were set to minus 250 pixels, minus 200 pixels, minus 150, minus 150, uh, sorry, minus 50, 0, 50, 100, 150, basically multiples of 50 with 0 being the middle plane. So they would be the end point. Or at least it'd be a reference to show that, you know, there's an even separation between them. What I did then was I parented all of those Z positions to a slider control on a different null and keyframed that to move between 0 and 1 and 
that's the that's the idea. In in reality, just because I've not got the project open in front of me, um, or the After Effects project open in front of me, it might have been that I actually I, I keyframed it over a larger amount. But it would still work because zero would mean that they're all on the same layer, and then the larger that slider control moves. The two, like the larger the value of that slider control, um, the higher the mul multiplication of the actual value the z position has been set to. So when that slider control is zero, the z position will be zero because it's zero times the slider control. Um, sorry, zero times the z position, and anything times zero is zero. When the slider control is set to 1, it'll be 1 times the Z position. When it's set to 2, it'll be 2 times the Z position. So what I was able to do was just slide with the slider control all of the layers out to the, where I wanted them to and just ease the transition from sort of tight to expanded. And it worked really well. And I was really pleased that I'd managed to get that to work because I didn't, uh, didn't think that was going to... Well, I I didn't really have a plan for it starting out, but I could sort of see that mo movement in my head. I just want to clarify. So just as I've been verbalizing this and vocalizing it, um, realized. So the important thing here is I haven't just parented the Z position to the sliding control. I parented. Well, I I wrote the expression. Um. Something like. Uh, like value times slider control, so that it would the, the you know the resultant z position would be the product of the slider control multiplied by the position I'd set it to, um, rather than you know just just setting it to because if it if it, if they were all set to just the slider control then they would all be in the same z position, so it's important that it's multiplying that instead of um, just being parented directly to it. Another shot that I want to talk about, and I've broken this down in detail um, in my shot breakdown video, is shot 10. And this is towards the end of the apply video. But I just want to talk about how proud I am of this shot. Because this is where I've had, I did some frame by frame. My drawing is quite limited, and I don't think I'll ever be a, you know, a, a competent uh 2d character animator because i just can't draw the same thing the same way twice but drawing controlled things so you know diagrams where it's really geometric and you can measure things and it's not just you know using the eye is a lot more doable for me so i found a, a free brush set on um google and the link to it is is in the behance project and i created you know this whole shot's worth of frames which is on eight frames a second to give the idea of it being like a sort of series of sheets of paper rather than footage i drew over every frame some sketches and like scribbles and dashes and things and little measurements whilst using the the, the smoother motion of the camera rotating around the cube um, as a sort of I guess it's like like something consistent in there so it's not just you know as a, a series of random scribbles there is like a thing that's actually developing there's a there's a thing that has a lifespan in this shot and it's the camera rotating around the cube and the little viewport showing you that um, rotation and the sketches just add to the character of it but then I also had the idea of and this is, you know, if, if anyone's looking to increase the realism of their VFX projects, the logic I used was, this is, you know, on paper. So I should put some things on here that you might find on paper. Which is why if you watch the shot at random frames, there are shots of like eraser rubbings you know when you rub out
pencil on paper and the eraser shavings like I left behind. So there's that. And I just put a light drop shadow on and I think it really works. It gives the feeling of you're looking at, you know, a series of, of sheets of paper and, you know, this sheet of paper has some like rubbings out on and this sheet of paper has some little pencil dust bits on it. Um, but it, yeah, it worked, it worked really well and I was really pleased with how it came out. And I actually, I'm, I'm going to explore this for my final year university project. Uh, because there's, I think there's a lot I can do with combining After Effects with frame by frame. I'd be interested to look at the sort of drawing techniques that are used to create motion and speed in anime and things like that and combine them with camera techniques like blur and focus. You know, um, creating depth in a pencil-drawn shot by having like a particle layer or a you know a foreground layer that's also drawn in pencil but blurred out using after effects and a background layer that's in focus and maybe that could shift you know how how much can i simulate real camera motion by using pencil drawings and 2d animation sensibilities but the physical you know the scientific uh outcomes of how we use a camera in the real world so you know you can maybe get like some distortion or um aberration or out of focus rack focus even down to like you know you could you could keyframe a, a, a rack focus that misses the uh misses miss, like misses focus and then adjusts itself as if there's an actual camera man uh, you know a camera operator who's changing the focus on the fictional camera in this world that, it, you know, it's not footage. It's, it's, it, I think there's a really interesting thing to explore there. I think it would be a really good future project um, that I want to look into, especially because a big influence for me at the minute is the Spider-Verse movie, Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse that came out, and the way that they've challenged formats by taking sensibilities of, one format and putting it into a different format specifically focus is simulated in the spider-verse film by using the printing techniques that would create a depth of field in the comic books so in comic books to create that depth of field you might offset your prints so that the colors would bleed over each other which would create make things a little hazier and if you watch the spider-verse movie anything out of focus does that same thing it's the same you know picture of that object but the the, the you know the, the slightly transparent and they overlap each other Almost like sort of adjusting the channels if you wanted to create a um, a glitch effect and you make that sort of, you know, the red and cyan overlapping but cut, like offset by a tiny bit. So that, that idea of taking comic book approaches and methods and putting it into a film. And, the, you know, they do that in all sorts. The, the, the shaders that are used on the 3D models are um, like crosshatch shaders and things like that so that's that's the sort of i'd be interested to explore that more because that is the that is carrying tropes of certain mediums of certain media into new media 2d animation doesn't require focus because it's you know it's all hand-drawn it isn't in the real world there isn't an actual physical camera pointing at something it's all hand-drawn it doesn't need to obey physics so what if you made it simulate an obedience to physics and what would be the realism of that and what would be the impact of that and what design styles could you get out of that and this, that's one thing that I'm really interested in pushing as well because I heard a really good phrase recently about you should strive to make art that appeals to both purist and tourist like don't just make something because it's cool 
don't make something so niche that it's inaccessible. Make something that is good art, but is also engaging. And I've actually just so earlier today, I was watching clips from Baby Driver, which is one of my favourite films from the last couple of years. And that and, and the Spider-Verse movie, actually. But both of those, I would say, are things that are artistically of note and acclaim and worth respect by you know the fellow industry members whilst also being something that the entire public can enjoy because baby drivers editing is super ambitious the mix of contemporary music with designated cuts with choreographed you know it's not just choreographed you know actors moving it's choreographed car chases and choreographed skids and donuts and you know crazy car stunts and for that to be executed well in a pretty, you know, s- s- stand-up story, like it, you know, it works. That you feel like you've watched a film, and it just so happens that that film does so much to pay attention to the liberties of the, or, you know, the the, the 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 possibilities of the creative medium, and it didn't need to do that because you can tell a story as basically as you want. But that film and the Spider-Verse film have, have taken these moves to not only create the film, but also to enrich the the film medium. And that's the sort of VFX generation that I want to help inspire going forward. Um, because I certainly want to be part of that. I want to be some of these I want to be one of those people that wants to do things for the advancement of the art that everyone can enjoy. Because that means that people are enjoying good art and then they will go to create good art and then they can inspire new people and they'll go to create good art and I think that's really important so I'm going to finish that there Um, that was just a sort of little overview to some of the thinking and design approaches um, in the Gen Zarelia brief number one which was the Gen Zarelia TV title sequence um to, to sort of introduce the whole project this podcast shop breakdown videos the Behance project are all a part of of this brief please check them out because it gives you a full idea of what I'm looking to produce every two weeks between you know uh, May and April of 2019 going on 2020 Um that yeah so it's it's the 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 thing to reiterate I'm, I'm, I'm my project is not just the deliverable it's not just the video of the title sequence the actual project itself is the extra material that has been created to explain what I've done um you know the 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 written reflection and the shot breakdowns and the podcast and I'm open to. I'm actually so. I'm. I'm. I'm sending this to my lecturer who oversaw my original fruit to labor project because he said he'd be interested to see me take this further anyway. That the fruit to labor concept. Um, I'm going to ask him what I can do to push this even more because I want to make this as accessible as possible. I want to make as many people as possible be able to get something from this that will help them increase their art. Um, you know the quality of it and the you know the ambition and the mindset and the strength of and conviction of their own belief in their own work and their own abilities so i guess the the key thing to remember is this project is for consumption like please ask me how i did things please ask me how i approach things or why I chose to do something a certain way right now I'm trying to pick sort of I was well for this episode I was trying to pick good examples of um, I did this because of this reason I did this because of this reason but it's you know I want to make sure that I, uh, I I'm, I'm actually answering people's questions so you know the, the, the more questions people want to give me the, the, the better because um, that lets me address real, real questions and real concerns, um, and things that people see a value in learning for themselves, and I want to be able to answer that. So, 
thank you so much for listening. Uh, I hope it's been enlightening um, and interesting to hear my my insights. Again, this is a episode one of something that could potentially be ongoing, but it's this whole brief has been part of an application, so it depends on whether I get the place on the thing. I'm going to be exploring the, the Gens Earlier project anyway, just maybe not to the same scale, because it, it if I'm not on the Adobe, you know, if I don't get a place on the Adobe Creative Residency, then I, I'm probably going to be working, which means I'm not going to have time as much to work on these projects and break them down and do all this sort of extra content out of it. But hopefully, fingers crossed, I'll be able to come back with uh, a lot more content very soon. So thank you for thank you for your time.